Uh, a pleasure to be with you here this morning at COGX. Hope you're having a, a wonderful time. And we have a fantastic panel who are going to be discussing the age of shocks this morning. And I'll introduce them one by one. On my right-hand side, we have uh, Melanie Gerson, who is what has been, amongst other things, head of cyber policy at the Tony Blair Institute and also currently is based at University College London. On my left-hand side, we have Pippa Malgren, uh, who has been the chief econo or the economic advisor to President George W. Bush and is a tech entrepreneur and best-selling author. We have Angus Mercer, who is Chief Executive of the Center for Long-Term Resilience. We're looking forward to a very exciting conversation this morning, and we will touch on a whole variety of the crises that are shaping the world today. But to start us off, I'm going to ask each of our panelists here just to give us a quick insight this morning about whether or not really the age that we're going through, the age of COVID, the age of the Russia-Ukraine war, the age of really huge change in tech, is genuinely something that marks a turning point. And maybe if it is, if there's something that can illustrate that for us today. So, Melody, I'm going to turn to you first to start us off. <laughs> I mean, hot seat. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you. Um, it's great to be here. I, as you list it like that, I think there's no doubt that when we have a confluence of events all happening simultaneously, it's bound to shake up the system as we know it and in the sort of create certainly some sort of systemic shock and sort of a wake up call for us to it's kind of rethink or hold a mirror to how we're doing what we're doing and are we doing it well? And in particular, thinking about the different actors, from my point of view, and the sort of work that I've been looking at, the different actors that are sort of coming to the forefront, both for good or for bad, and how we leverage that. But certainly, we're seeing systemic change, and we're thinking about where tech sits in that, of how that interaction happens, and who are the key actors or potential important actors that can no longer be left to the sidelines. So if I could just push you perhaps for one example of where you think there's something really transformative, it could be good or bad in the world right now, Melanie, what would be your top choice? I think of what we were talking about earlier, I think it has to be Elon Musk and Starlink and how that's really reshaped if we look at, uh, particularly with the Russia-Ukraine conflict, how intervening there, keeping the internet running and communication running materially affected what was traditional strategic warfare ambition to cut off a communication to then ravage a city and that certain denied and, and not just uh, Starlink but alongside another a number of other tech companies I could talk about later but really materially affected how this war is playing out. Really great specific example to start us off with and, and genuinely transform it I think as you as you say. Pippa, could we turn to you? Are we at a turning point moment? And if so, could you give us something granular that is turning at this particular point? There's a very interesting phenomena which Buckminster Fuller, the famous um, architect, geophysicist, uh, described as the knowledge doubling curve, which is at the speed at which information is accumulating and that you need to understand to make a, a decision doubles all the time. So in 1900, it was doubling every century. 1945, it's doubling every 25 years. 1985, it's doubling annually. And IBM is now confirmed by 2020, it doubles every 12 hours. So the speed at which you have to operate is genuinely different from anything we've experienced in history. But the good news is, and the turning points are, that the pace of technological innovation is so extraordinary. As an example, there's a young kid who just won the, the James Dyson Award. I mean, he's 27, I call him a young kid, but he's 27 and he came, a Philippine national who came up with the idea that you could take food waste, turn it into solar panels that capture UV light. And it's a revolution in, soul, in, in energy. And similarly, um, we're just seeing the Chinese announced sol uh, a space-based solar power. These are going to totally diminish our need for hydrocarbons, right? Now, how fast is a different question, but things are moving faster than ever. So I would say this is a return to normal, but it's very different from what we've had for the last 30 years. So there's a massive adjustment going on. Let me turn to you, Gus. Uh 
turning point at the moment? And if so, where do you see the most important part of that turn? Thanks, Rana. It's uh, great to be here alongside you all today. I, I think that, yes, there is a, a bit of a turning point here. Um, I'll keep my remarks in the ballpark of extreme risks, which is the, the risks that we trade in every day at CLTR, the, the think tank that I co-founded a few years ago. Um, and by extreme risks, I mean COVID-19 plus in terms of the level of the threat, but, but not just pandemics. Think, for, sim for simple terms, think ABC, AI, biosecurity, climate change, those sorts of big global challenges. Um, and I think we are at a turning point here. Um, and in terms of the specific issues that I worry about, I, I, can, I can talk about them in terms of a couple of statistics. I think it was about a month ago that the World Economic Forum released a poll of risk experts, and it said that nine out of 10 risk experts think that the, the global outlook is becoming more fractured, um, more catastrophic. So we're heading in the wrong direction. And if you look at extreme risks specifically, the uh, Oxford academic Toby Ord wrote a fantastic book called The Precipice, um, ironically about two months before COVID-19 hit, I think it was published. And he crunched the numbers and came up with a, a figure, a, a relatively rough and ready figure, but a pretty startling one, which is there is a one in six chance that we suffer an existential catastrophe over the next hundred years that stems from one of these extreme risks. There is a lot that we can do about it. There are concrete, actionable policy interventions that governments can make um, and that we can make globally that can have a real world impact here. And uh, I can speak to that later. Well, could I throw that thought to you, Pippa, in a different sense? Because all that fossil fuel, all that oil, all that gas from Russia is not going nowhere. It's now being funneled much more east than it is west. It's going to China, of course. It's also going to India, which is one of those intriguing states, again, a state in which the tech world actually has a huge amount of interest now and is providing cheap fuel for a whole variety of enterprises there. Do you see a sort of eastward turn in the Russian energy market having a wider effect on the global economy in the way that Melanie's hinted at? Yes, and we need to think about commodities beyond energy, including wheat and food. And in my personal judgment, Putin absolutely wanted these secondary and tertiary effects of the war in Ukraine to hit the world economy. And that is because, in my view, and I started to write about this in late October last year, and I know what I'm about to say is very shocking, but I argued that we are already in World War III. The good news is that this war is not being conducted on the ground with civilians, except in one location so far. Everywhere else, we're basically at war between the superpowers in space, in cyberspace, on the high seas, particularly submarine warfare, all locations that the public can't see. So I've described it as we're in a hot war in cold places. The Arctic is another place where we're absolutely nose to nose. Um, and Africa as well, which although a hot place, it's a place that the media gives a cold shoulder to, right? So we can call it, we're having a hot war in cold places. And interestingly, we're now having a cold war in hot places, particularly Pacific Islands. And you've seen the Chinese reach out to the Solomon Islands and 10 other islands. And everybody's like, why do they care about islands? It matters if you're in submarine warfare. And so fundamentally, we have to understand we've got to reframe what is the fight. If we keep looking at it as it's only Ukraine, we're going to have a particular understanding of reality. Could, could, but this is global in nature, and it is meant to be by the superpowers. So could I push you on one of the words you use there, Pippa? I think you know people will find that quite alarming in many ways. Sorry. That's probably your intention, no, no, to make sure that <laughs> people are paying attention. You use the word war rather than competition, let's say, which is a term yes. that's heard both in the EU and with the current US administration. In the Arctic, war and or space. Why are you using the word war rather than competition? What's the difference? I'll give you one very specific example. I would say this war officially began January 7th, which was the day the head of the British Defense Forces, Sir Tony Radican, came out and said an event occurred that absolutely should be construed as an act of war. And that was the fastest internet cable in the world is in a tiny little island in Norway called Svalbard. And it's a double cable, very unusual. Why is it there? Because every satellite, pretty much less than 5,000 miles high, connects to Earth at that point, including the International Space Station. And it seems that someone, we won't say who, 
cut the cable a six and a half kilometer distance apart and took the middle piece away so no one could confuse it with an accident. And what was that about? It's about all your military guidance systems are based on GPS. And frankly, the entire tech community of the world depends on the internet. You cut this, you cut satellites. This is a very profound event. Now that is Arctic, that is space, and that is conflict. That's, and that's war. Gus, can I turn to you? What does your training about long-term resilience tell you about food supply and the effects of the Russia war on that question? There's a really interesting opportunity in all of this. If you look at Ian Bremmer's recent book, The, the Power of Crisis, um, he talks about how we need to leverage these moments that are really big ticket moments in our history where precisely because the world is so fractured and scary and the risks that we face in many ways are, are, are risks that we've never faced before in human history. Melanie talks about, um, or rather Pippa, excuse me, talks about the, 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 the challenges that we're facing around um, Russia, Ukraine, and potentially we're currently at war. Um, I would argue that with respect to extreme risks, AI, biosecurity, climate change, um, in many cases, these risks stem from emerging technologies that haven't been around very long. And because they haven't been around very long, we don't really have a playbook in terms of how to deal with them. Um, but the good news is because yeah. we are in this moment, we have a crisis, there is an opportunity to do something fundamental but about it. Isn't there a problem inherent to what you've, you've, you've just given us um, there, Gus? Because you've given us a really interesting account, and we're going to come back in just two minutes, actually, to some of the implications of that technology. But one of the problems about famine is that, in some sense, it's a very old world problem. It's just something that we haven't actually seen in that form for quite some time. And the question of if you're in a situation where actually there's a war going on right now, which is preventing cereal crops being uh, uh, harvested and actually brought to large parts of the world right now, is it not justified for politicians and people involved with NGOs to say, let's try and find out how to feed people, and then, you know, something like the question of AI biosecurity has to take, if not a back seat, at least a sort of secondary seat, while we deal with the fact that people are starving? Is that a, is that a reasonable division to make? Yes, absolutely. Uh, I would in no way argue that we shouldn't be trying to deal with immediate causes and immediate crises famines, floods, terrorism. For me, this is a yes and question. It's, it's not a case of diverting existing resources away from people who are desperate and need help. I think this is about addressing the root causes of some of these issues. And even if some of the issues, as you say, like, like, like droughts, like famine are age old, their causes aren't and their causes are shifting. And the things that are bringing about, the, the risk factors that are bringing about these issues are in many ways new and, and governments need to start to address them. Can we overcome the age of shocks that we're living through now by looking to include more people, more thinkers, a different way of doing things, more grassroots? Um, I mean, I've, we were talking about this uh, before, I mean, the need for diverse voices at the table. I think what we need to still step back and remember that there's still 4.1 billion people to get onto the internet. That, and the very internet that's required to do this is at, under threat from geopolitics and being under threat of being ripped apart. So we need to sort of sometimes, you know, it's very easy to get full throttle into like the fast innovation ecosystem and there is so much possibility there. But that diversity of voices making sure that that includes low and middle income countries, that includes the different perspectives, that AI ethics is being framed from not just from white, you know, white western liberal order but we're including a diverse range of voices into that on, on, on that melanie i mean we are you know in general the conversations for very understandable reasons in the west very wary about china but if you had to mention a middle income country on average that has actually internet enabled huge numbers of its population china would be the poster child wouldn't it uh, it would be, and also the way they're rolling it out across Africa, across Pacific, across. I was uh, not long ago uh, in the Caribbean. If you opened the Lucky newspaper, <laughs> <laughs> it was for work. <laughs> but oh, it's a good place to have to go for work. Yes. But, uh, but you open the newspaper, and it's like a China fan club newspaper in the middle of an island in the Caribbean because they're providing the infrastructure, and with that, the potential for philosophy. And they're being the agents of growth, but that we also have to work with that and not against it in enabling voices from lower middle income countries to work with the structure they've been given safely to still be part of the innovation economy that we also envisage. Gus, COVID lessons. From the perspective of COVID-19, um, I think clearly there are lessons to learn across 
the world in terms of how, the, uh, how we responded to COVID-19 and how prepared we were for it. Um, in the UK, I think it's, it's instructive to look at our national risk register. Um, pandemics were on there, but we were out by an order of magnitude in terms of the, the predicted number of fatalities that a non-flu pandemic like COVID-19 could cause. So, so clearly there's, there's low-lying fruit there in terms of improvements. Um, but what's really crucial when it comes to COVID-19 and learning the appropriate lessons is that we can't just fight the last war. We can't just prepare a better COVID-19 plan. We need to think about the full range of biological threats that keep biosecurity experts up at night. And, and make no mistake, COVID-19, as, as tragic as it was, could have been a lot worse. And we need to think about how it could have been worse. We need to think about not just naturally occurring pandemics. We need to think about the full range of threats. We need to think about uh, lab security and biosafety and, and how to make sure that we are regulating our labs in the same way that we regulate our airlines, for example. Um, and when it comes to biological security more broadly than that, we need to look at um, biological weapons and how easy, uh, and Pippa has alluded to this already, how easy it is to, uh, to synthesize pathogens and the access that many people will have, many smart people will have, to be able to do immense harm. So we need to just not just fight the last war, but look at the full range of threats that we face. And I'm encouraged, I have to say, by how well we're doing on that front in the UK. There is a wholesale review of the UK's approach to biosecurity underway at the moment. Um, lots of, lots of organisations, I think, are feeding into that. There's obviously the COVID-19 inquiry that will, that will listen, importantly, to, to victims and their families, as well as technologists and, academ and academia. So I think we're moving in the right direction and we're starting to realise that we are in this, Gus, this that, important moment. That, that, that's great to, to have. What I'm going to do with a very limited time is to give each of our other two speakers perhaps 30 seconds each just to add a, a cap on, on that thought. Pippa. Uh, well, actually, do you mind if I go back to this yes, question on the silent the war silent that war, was directed yes. to yeah, me? Of course. So um, I lecture at Sandhurst and I uh, occasionally brief the NATO generals. So and I spend a lot of time in the strategic security world. And I would say the fundamental driver is a kind of arrogance that comes from the fact that the conflict is happening in locations no one in the general public can see. Because we have... Uh, sa events happening with satellites being blown up in space, there's no one there to witness it. So, and I would say, second of all, um, when I talk to journalists, I say, why are you not covering the story of the Svalbard cable cut? Why are you not covering the story of satellites being blown up and creating debris fields? And, and the answer is, um, one of the editors said to me, if it bleeds, it leads. That's the rule. In other words, if there's no human who has died, there's no story. Now, I have fear that this means we're going to get more dead humans because we won't report what's happening that could lead to that. An important warning. Thank you, Pippa. And a brief thought from Melanie. Yeah, just to build on that, that if the one thing we learn from an age of shocks and things not being reported is to take that breath, to look at sort of some honest self-criticism at what we're missing and to rededicate ourselves to doing it right, because that's how we're going to have to move forward. Wise words for a very important era, the age of shocks, but I think we've been reassured there are voices and thoughts and ideas, I hope, that are going to help us get through it in the next 5, 10 or 50 years, however long it might be. We've had a wonderful event for our panel. I wish we could have more, but enjoy the rest of COGX. And thank you very much to Gus Mercer, to Pippa Malgren, and to Melanie Garson. Thank you. <laughs>